Hello, and welcome to the U.S. Geological Survey Public Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us for our month, our lecture this month, excuse me. My name is Amelia, and I will be your host and moderator today. I want to give a quick thank you to all of you again that have been with us since we've gone completely virtual in the last two years or so, but also to all of our new subscribers, which have been many in the last couple of weeks. We welcome you and we hope um, we're so happy that you've taken an interest in our uh, public lecture series and we hope you enjoyed tonight's lecture. Before I get started with introducing our speaker, I have a few announcements to make and hopefully it would allow others to kind of have an extra moment or two to get settled. First, I'd like to give you a heads up about our lecture in November. Due to the holiday season, we will be having a lecture a little bit earlier in the month, which will be on November 17th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And our speaker that month will be John Mola, talking about endangered bumblebees, science on the threats and recovery. So please make sure that you save that date in your calendar. And um, as for the month of December, we will be taking a bit of a break um, and we will be back with a whole new set of lectures starting January 26th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 2023. Towards the end of the lecture, I will provide information on how you can our mailing list so you can be notified of all of our uh, Lectures that we have in store for you. Next, I wanted to take a second to give you some tips on a few features on this team's platform. One feature we want to direct your attention to is the question and answers panel, which can be opened by clicking on the question mark icon on the upper right hand corner of your screen. At the end of the lecture, I will have a we will have a Q&A session, and this is the panel where you can submit your questions for our speaker. And just a heads up, um, we may not have time to get to every single question, but we will certainly do our best. Another feature we have is closed captioning. If you're watching this on your desktop computer, just look on the bottom right hand corner of the screen for the closed captions icon. You can also use the stream text to view the live closed captions. Please see the stream text link provided in the Q&A window panel. And now it's time to introduce you to our speaker this evening. Manuela Huso is an Emerita Research Statistician with the U.S. Geological Surveys, Forest and Rangeland Ecosy Ecosystems Science Center in Corvallis, Oregon. Since 2004, she's been involved in design and analysis of post-construction fatality monitoring studies at wind a solar panel solar power facilities and has been part of several experiments to test the efficiency of various methods proposed to reduce wildlife mortality at wind facilities, including operation, operational curtailment and acoustic deterrence. In her talk, she will discuss how we measure wildlife mortality at wind and solar power facilities and some approaches currently being investigated to reduce the impacts. Manuela has had many achieve achievements in her career. And this year, she was a recipient of the highest honorary recognition from the Department of Interior, the Distinguished Service Award for her contributions in science. We are very fortunate to have Manuela with us tonight, so let's please give her a warm virtual welcome to Manuela Huso. Thank you for being here. I will now hand it over to you. Well, good evening and uh, thank you very much for inviting me and for that really nice introduction. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. Great. So um, actually, it's really nice to be here because um, I'm, I'm coming back. Um, when I first started with the USGS in 2011, I was asked to be a part of this series when it was the Menlo Park series. Um, that was when I first started, had just left Oregon State University. Now, 11 years later, I'm really happy to be back um, and glad to talk to you about advances that we've had in wind-wildlife interactions. 
But before I go any farther, um, this talk has not been peer reviewed, and so I just need to say the disclaimer that says that um, this not it's not endorsed by the U.S. government. You got um, anyway. So. Just 20 years ago, when we thought about wind power, we might have thought about, I don't know, picturesque mills dotting the Dutch lands, uh, landscape, or maybe an occasional lonely pump out in the um, arid west. But now, wind turbines take on this form, and they're much more um, often look like this than they did with our, our uh, picturesque images. So anyway, I don't know how many of you have actually been near one, but they're deceptively small to me. Um, they look deceptively small when I'm passing them on the highway. But in fact, when I first started with USGS 10 years ago, turbines were about 80 meters tall. Here's an image just over here. You can see in the red circle a friend of mine, John Hay, standing at the base of them. They're huge. Um, they had blades that were 45 meters long and their swept area was about 0.6 hectares or 1.6 acres. They travel at about 20 revolutions per minute, and what that means is that their tip speed is almost 300 kilometers per hour. Um, since then, though, that was, uh, that was the modern turbine of that day. Ten years later, our modern turbines are now 100 meters tall at the nacelle, the place where the turbine um, mechanisms are. Um, their blades are 75 meters long. They sweep 1.8 or three times as much area, 1.8 hectares or three times as much area. But they don't revolve any faster. Their speed at the, or um, their rotation speed is actually quite a bit less than it is for the smaller turbines resulting in a tip speed of about the same um, speed. That may have implications for their, um, their impacts to wildlife. Back at the turn of the century in 2001, um, we had enough capacity installed in the US to be able to power about a million homes. 10 years later, we had increased that by tenfold to about 47, megawatt, 47 gigawatt capacity. And now in 2021, we've tripled that again. So now we have about 140 gigawatts of capacity. That's enough to power about 25% of the homes in the US. Of course, all wind energy isn't devoted just to homes. Homes represent only about 20% of what is actually used in the, in the US. And so we have, a long ways to go. Um, our goals in the US, as stated by the Assistant Secretary for Energy, is to, one, to achieve a carbon free electricity sector by 2035 and a net zero greenhouse gas emissions for economy wide no later than 2050. The graphic here is not really something you need to focus on a lot, but it's just to show you that wind, the one in blue, needs to pretty much um, multiply by again tenfold in order to reach these goals. So we've got a lot of build out that's going to occur. <clears throat> so, um, of course, not all wind, sorry, um, as with all forms of energy, wind power is not without its costs. U.S. is in a really, I think, unique position, not only to encourage the development of alternative energies, but also to balance their development against the social and the environmental costs that they might impose. When development occurs on landscapes that are otherwise undisturbed by human activity, one of the major costs is to native wildlife. But these costs can take many different forms. First, we have displacement of species such as the sage grouse, that appears to move farther and farther from turbines um, with each breeding season. Um, migration routes or home range can be disrupted, as has been shown in the Iberian wolf in Portugal. Habitat destruction can happen, um, particularly out in the desert and particularly with solar facilities when desert tortoises are displaced. But actually, every once in a while, there's environmental enhancement. In the Altamont, when um, 
Turbines went in, grazing was stopped, and as a result, rodenticides were no longer used because the holes were not of concern to the cattle breaking their legs. Rodents populations went up, and so did raptor populations. They loved um, perching on these uh, towers. So it's it's uh, it's kind of <laughs> just a take home that says it's all connected. Everything's connected to everything. So one thing might be enhanced, and one thing might be deterred. So fatality can also be caused indirectly when, for example, in offshore wind, the pile driving can cause the, ex I guess, the explosion of uh, fish swim bladders if they're really close to the pile, dri pile drivers. Um, and finally, we can have direct fatality where animals collide directly with the turbines, as you can see in the left-hand corner there. This uh, video was taken by Jason Horn, 2005. So, Turbines can have mortality impact. Why do we care? Well, first we care because we're dealing with um, species that perhaps are endangered. Um, we want to reduce those effects. We want to anticipate the effects. And in particular, we wanna be proactive so that we can maybe find ourselves not in the position of, as, of the hydro industry needing to refit um, or maybe even remove dams in order to preserve salmon. So tonight, um, I'm going to talk about my work, which primarily is um, in the statistics side, estimating the direct mortality of birds and bats at wind power facilities, as well as rare species, which pose a, a particular um, problem. I guess they're a little bit different to deal with. Um, and then I'm going to go really quickly through some approaches to reducing that people have done all over for reducing impacts. So when we're estimating mortality, um, how do we go about doing that? Well, we send out people and sometimes dog people teams to search for dead animals. And we count what we find. But of course, what we find is not um, everything that's killed out there. But before I go about telling you how we go, we actually estimate what's out there, I'm going to put a, forth an analogy. We're going to imagine that we're at a party and the, uh, the people there say, hey, let's play a game. Let's play stump the statistician. We need a volunteer. So I volunteer to go out of the room and they say, hmm, let's see, let's flip a coin as many times as we want to, and then ask her and, and see how many heads we count, and then ask her to tell us how many times we flipped the coin. So let's flip it 10 times. So they asked me to come back in the room and they say, we observed seven heads. Can you tell us how many flips we made? Well, I think about it and I say, hmm, you observed seven. I know the probability of a, of a fair coin flipping ahead is um, t is one in two, so 0.5. So I'm gonna divide, divide seven by 0.5 and give the answer of 14. I think you flipped 14 times. So of course, the room burst into laughter because they were able to stump the statistician. But let's think about what happened there. First of all, we know that if I they, they tell me that we flipped seven times, we know I, or sorry, that they found seven heads, we know we couldn't have flipped any less than seven times. But if it had been seven times, what's the probability that we would have flipped all 10 heads? Well, it's pretty small. So it's unlikely that that's the answer. It's also unlikely that it's eight times, even though that's more likely. What I'm showing you here is a graph that says, if we flipped zero through 25 times, if we flipped eight times, what's the probability that those flips would have generated seven heads? That's the y axis. So eight times is, um, it's more likely to see seven heads than it is if you flip just seven times, but not much, not very likely at all. And it keeps getting more likely until you get to the middle and then it starts to drop off. So the most likely um, flips that were made in order to generate seven heads are somewhere between 13 and 14. And in fact, that's what maybe some of you have heard of. It's a maximum likelihood estimate. That's the most likely number of flips. That's why I guessed it.
But what you should also notice is that uh, flipping 12 times or flipping 15 times isn't all that much more, much less likely than flipping 13 or 14. So what we do is we say, we don't really know, but we can give you a, an interval within which it's, if you were to repeat this process millions and millions of times, 95% of the time, the number of flips that you flip to generate seven heads would land within this interval, somewhere between nine and 23. That's called a 95% interval. So I guessed 10, and as a statistician, I get to say I was right. So the point here is that even if we know the probability of detection exactly, we will never know fatality exactly, unless, of course, the detection probability is very, very close to one. And if it is, then our estimate will be a lot closer to actual fatality. But most of the time when we're dealing with this, we don't have detection probability close to one. So now we'll take that analogy and put it into real life. What happens, let's imagine that these are all bats that were killed at wind power um, turbines. Well, first of all, some of them disappear because scavengers come and take them away before we even have a chance to, for our search teams to find them. We don't have the money to search all of the turbines, so we don't see anything that's at turbines that we don't search. We can only search a certain distance out because again, that costs a lot of money to go out there, to go far away from the turbines. And so we don't see those that are land beyond our search plots. <clears throat> Sometimes our search plots are in dangerous ground. We can't send somebody to look it for bats and birds in, in areas like that. And so even then within search plots, we can't search some areas. And finally, we're only humans or we're only dogs and we don't see everything. So we can take this is what happened. And what we find is this. And our job as statisticians is to tell you how many were really killed. Our job is to say, if, if you would take this analogy to be the, um, the number of heads that were flipped, how many times were they flipped to give us the total mortality? However, most of the time we don't have a detection probability that's as close to 0.5. That would be a pretty good one. We have to determine what our detection probability is. We have to find out what fraction do we miss. So we do some experiments. We set out um, trials to find out how many are scavenged. And maybe the scavengers take away one third, leaving two thirds to be potentially found. Maybe we only search two thirds of the turbines. So one third of, of the, all the animals that um, are killed, probably we won't find them. Maybe we can search um, the area that encompasses about half of the um, animals that are killed. And then we're, like I said, we're only human or dogs. Um, we might miss as many as a quarter of them, let's say, um, leaving 75% to be found. So we need an accurate measure of the percent loss due to each of these factors. We put those together to estimate our detection probability or the equivalent of the probability of flipping a, a heads. And in this case, it came out to be, the, it, because these are independent events, um, whether a, a, once a scavenger has taken something, my chance of seeing what's remaining isn't dependent on the scavenger. Um, this, in this example, it just turned out to be about one, uh, about one in six. So when we're doing this, we need to account for all kinds of variable detections that I've just mentioned. But we also have to keep in mind that for different species, we have different scavenger pressures for different vegetation types, for different seasons. Um, animals, a, a large white pelican will be much more easy to see than a small brown sparrow. And so their, their probability of detection, even if they're, if they're there, are gonna be different. So we have to estimate this probability of, de of detection for every single carcass. And it's really not as simple as I say right here. It looks more like this. And even after that, what's really important is that we understand that the number that we might give you by taking what we observe and dividing by detection probability isn't right we can only at best give you an interval. So the uncertainty is very critical. So one thing that we've done, our team led by Dan Dalthorpe has produced some software that has taken that complex equation 
and its estimates of variance to put into software that people can use to estimate mortality from what they find and from what they have measured as these different components of detection probability. It's really important that we have something that allows that so that we can make reasonable comparisons among turbines so that we can see patterns in regions and in sites. Um, it also allows us to do experimentation and to test minimization approaches that I'll talk to you about later. This software has been very useful, and I think that's one of the reasons that I was awarded the, the Distinguished Service Award, was that it, it now is used um, in many, many parts of the world. So let's move to protected species, um, protected by any of these acts. What the issue there is that there aren't very many of them in the first place, so there aren't very many that actually are killed at turbines in general. However, we're concerned when even one or two is killed. So for us to be able to say with certainty that none were killed or that only one or two it's, were killed, it's a difficult task. Um, what we do is we've taken statistical um, theory and asked how to interpret when we don't find any rare species. Um, can we interpret that as meaning that none or very few were killed? Well, as I hope you've been able to see, if protection, if your detection probability is high, then it's not very likely that you will have missed many. So even if you find zero, it's not likely that there are lots out there that you could have missed. However, when your detection probability is low, let's say one in 10, it's easy to miss 10, even 20 of them, and that would be cause for concern. <clears throat> So we were able to, um, we, we then said, let's turn this question around then. Let's, let's give in, um, industry and fish and wildlife information on what kind of detection probability they should be shooting for in order to be able to claim that few, if any, endangered species were killed when none were found. So we can then say, if our detection probability is X and we found Y, what can we rule out as having been missed? <clears throat> so this resulted in a completely different piece of software that's called evidence of absence. Hope you can maybe see the, the leopard in that, which just is there to show you how difficult it is to, to give evidence of absence um, so that people can interpret the evidence that permitted take at facilities has not been exceeded. This is very important in, in uh, management. And we provide tools to design monitoring to achieve that probability of detection and tools to project current take rates into the future to help with species management. So now that we know how to measure, what can we do to reduce mortality? Well, here are four things that I'm going to focus on tonight, and I'm afraid I'm going to be kind of going pretty um, rapidly through them. Um, I'm going to talk about what people are doing and have done in order to address each of these ways in which we might be able to reduce mortality. Um, I'll go through each of them, and with, within each of them, I'll talk about birds and bats because they're different. So first thing we can do is cite appropriately. And one of the a great tool that we have that was has come out of USGS in collaboration with several um, organizations, uh, both private and public, um, is this wind turbine database. In it is every single turbine in the US, its height, its, um, its dimensions, its location, um, its megawatt capacity for producing electricity, and all of that data is downloadable by, by anyone who wants it. So a map like this shows where the higher concentrations of um, turbines are. You can see a lot in the central plains, quite a few in the, in the northeast, a little a bit over here in uh, Oregon, Washington, and over in California, um, and almost none, actually pretty close to none, in the southeast because the winds just aren't appropriate there. So what can we do with that? Well, Here's an example. Birdcast in the Cornell Lab has put together a, um, a, so a piece of software that will allow you to look at migration 
intensity at any time um, during the year. If we were to, oh, people are also looking at radar, uh, using radar to map bats and birds, as well as even butterflies and their um, eruption patterns. So if we were to overlay the map of the migration with the map of the turbines, we could probably make some, some forecasts onto where, where and when the highest risk might occur. Again, from Corga, uh, Cornell Labs, they produce um, maps of bird observations from the eBird uh, database. This example is a whooping crane. Um, and you can see that here the purple indicates where eBird has reported whooping crates as being sighted. You can see that they, again, they also fly through the center of the US and a bit over here south the, um, of the Great Lakes. And if we overlap that with the um, wind turbine database, it looks like there's a bit of overlap here, especially in um, Texas and Oklahoma, where the flyway or where, where um, broken cranes have been observed overlaps quite a bit with, with turbines. Farther up north, it looks like they fly quite a bit to the west of where the turbines are concentrated. Maybe here under the Great Lakes is another place of concentration. This can tell us, give us some ideas of where we might have high risk. I do want to emphasize, though, that as far as I know, no whooping cranes have been found dead at turbines, and so it's not it's not just enough to know where they are or or when, but we also have to know a little bit more about their behavior. That brings me to another study. Now, to address this, some colleagues, U.S. colleagues, uh, paired with academics, um, well, the the U.S. people captured 100 eagles bald eagles and placed GPS trackers on them and recorded their three-dimensional location, X and Y on the land, and then how high above the ground they were, so X, Y, and Z, um, every three to 10 seconds when they were flying. So then we used those data um, to, and to derive from them velocity and um, direction, whether they were rising or descending, um, how rapidly they were turning, et cetera, and use software, um, some statistical models to assign to each one of those time points a behavior. And those behaviors, there were three of them, the bird could be ascending, it could be flapping, or it could be gliding. This first map over here is just looking at the XY locations of the birds as if you were looking down from them. So this is the path a bird followed. This is just an example bird. Over here, it shows what their um, velocity was against time. So all it's doing is telling us when the bird was flying quite rapidly and when it was flying more slowly. And you can see that when it ascends, the yellow, it's flying more slowly. It's harder to get to fly, you know, to fly upward. When it's descending or gliding, um, it's blue and it's it's flying much more rapidly. So our statistical models seem very consistent with what we're seeing in the in the data. This last graph just shows how far above the ground the birds were and what they were doing. And again, you can see that the ascending pattern, the yellow, really does represent the bird increase or increasing its altitude and then flying down. So what did we do with that? We took that and said, okay, what what behaviors are occurring when the bird is within that space or that altitude that represents risk from turbines? Somewhere about 200 meters, maybe 250 meters down to the ground. And what kinds of behaviors were they doing when they were in those spaces? With that, we put together models that then allowed us to give to make a map of Iowa. This was only done for Iowa, of where high risk um, areas might B. We found that along riparian areas um, was were places where birds had a tendency to fly within that rotor swept zone um, at low speeds and hence be at risk. So this is a, a way that this could be used for um, for maybe helping to locate sites, future sites for turbines. For bats. <clears throat> 
The US, several US agencies have collaborated with state and provincial agencies, academics, to develop a statistically based sampling network to um, sample bats throughout North America. Primarily it's done with acoustic sampling. The network is becoming much more extensive as it as it grows um, in and uh, but again, one of the things we can do is superimpose this network on the turbine database and see that it looks like there's a few gaps in the network that we have for monitoring bats where there are some pretty heavy um, build out of turbines. So um, they are working to try and make that coverage even more dense than it is, um, and it could be very useful for future sighting. So now we're going to move. Um, oh no, we're going to move. We're staying with sighting, but but with the uh, idea that behavior is important. A study led by Bat Conservation International was was um, has been very useful. The uh, what they did was they took very high um, quality thermal cameras and placed them 25 meters from the turbines at the base on the ground, 25 meters from the turbine at right angles to each other so that they had overlapping view sheds. From that then they could have um, three, they knew because of the overlap, they could um, point to where a bat was every, you know, every second as it was flying through that view space. So we would get these, this is, we get three dimensional information about where bats are. Of course, this is represented only in two dimensions, but you can see looking down from the turbine, each one of these little squiggly lines represents a trace of a, of a bat path, flight path. Looking towards the turbine, you can also see where the bat, bats are flying and then looking to the side of the turbine, windward, leeward, windward to the left, leeward, leeward to the right. Um, so it's really interesting. You can see that the bats actually go through the rotor swept zone. Sometimes these turbines were spinning, sometimes they weren't. Not all bats going through the space are killed, um, clearly. But um, it does give you a huge sense of what a bat is doing when, what are the conditions, where where, um, what is the weather? What's the wind doing? Was, is it raining? All that kind of stuff can help us understand what behaviors bats have around turbines. And by knowing that, hopefully help un understand when it is we can modify the behavior of the turbines in order to save some bats. I just wanted to point out that there is some limitation in the, um, in the view shed of the thermal cameras that, will be even more difficult when we get to these bigger turbines that have a 75 meter blade rather than a 45 meter blade. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, now, moving on from away from sighting decisions to the second way that we have of um, reducing impacts to wildlife, and that is to modify the turbine operations. Several groups are working on um, mounting cameras on the turbines, sometimes on the nacelle, sometimes on the, on the um, supporting pole, but they're doing that in order to be able to use cameras to identify when an eagle or an endangered species like an eagle, a bald eagle, um, <clears throat> or a golden eagle approaches the turbine. When it approaches the turbine, when it signals that it's approached the turbine, the uh, camera sends a signal to to the turbine operating system to turn the turbines off. Um, as you can imagine, you know, it's quite difficult to accurately identify an approaching eagle. An object that fills the, the screen or fills a certain number of pixels, let's say, um, may be a large bird, an eagle, far away, or it could be a small bird close to the camera. So, um, or it may be a turkey vulture rather than an eagle. So, a lot of work is being done now to improve that detection accuracy so that um, unnecessary shutdowns will be lessened. Condors, an endangered species that represent that uh, gives us a completely different example. Condors, um, when they were, are released from their breeding and cap, cap, captive programs, um, are fitted with GPS tags. 
facilities in Condor, um, within Condor ranges, have take have used this to their advantage. They have um, machines that will detect the signals from the GPS that the condors are wearing. And so as soon as they hear one of those coming along, they shut the turbines down. It's a, it's a really great technique. One kind of uh, drawback, I guess, um, it's, is that as the condor populations continue to increase, not all of the young that are born in the wild are um, mount, uh, have GPS tags mounted on them. And so um, as the population increases, that particular approach isn't going to work for them. And maybe the other camera approaches will be better. For bats, shutting down the turbines when bats are known to be at risk has actually proven to be quite successful. Um, facilities that are in the bat migratory pathways um, or in the range of endangered species of bats sometimes shut down at night when winds or at, throughout the fall when winds are below five meters per second, which is or seven meters per second in the case of Indiana bats, um, which is about 10 or 15 miles an hour. Shutting down the turbines does reduce bat mortality. It's been shown several times, um, but it also does reduce electric power production. Nonetheless, the American Wind Energy Association has made its, its policy to disallow the rotation of turbines below what's called manufacturer cut-in speed, which is usually about three miles per hour. Turbines can turn at lower wind speeds, but they don't generate electricity. And so they're, they're there, essentially what they call freewheeling, there to catch the wind and basically be ready to produce energy. But because no energy is produced, um, it's a relatively um, minimal cost to the energy producers to um, disallow their turbines from rotating when there's no energy produced, and yet it can save bats. So it's great that that cooperation is going on. However, there is one issue with this approach. So some facilities, as I said, um, curtail when winds are below five meters per second. This, this approach um, has effects that can differ greatly among sites. If you think about it, a site that is not particularly windy in the fall um, might, have, um, might have to shut down quite often because the winds are often below five meters per second. That would result probably in saving quite a few bats, but would result in a, um, quite a bit of electricity loss. On the other side, a site that has, um, is very windy and almost never drops below five meters per second, um, might rarely shut down, resulting in very little, if any, reduction in mortality, but also little loss in electricity production. So it's not a one size fits all solution, and it's definitely a solution that um, has different implications at different sites. So now we're gonna shift to deterring animals from approaching the turbines. Uh, there are some people who are working on the same idea about the cameras, mounting cameras on turbines, detecting and recognizing eagles when they approach. But rather than um, shutting down the turbines, they're emitting large or loud noises that are intended to scare the turbine or the eagles from approaching the turbines. One concern about this approach is that the potential for eagles to become insensitive to this, um, this sound is a possibility. Um, we've seen that in geese that become insensitive to gunshots that are meant to scare them from grazing in grain fields. And so there's a concern that if those loud sounds are, are uh, emitted unnecessarily, um, eagles might become inured. That's a current area of study. You might have heard about this study that was quite a splash, made quite a splash last year. Um, it was a study done in Norway where they painted just a single blade of the turbine black. And what they found was a reduced mortality of white-tailed eagles at this facility in Smule. Um, this study was a very small study. Some might consider it a pilot study. And I believe it's being replicated in a few places um, 
now because it is such a, an elegant solution. Um, it would be great if it could work, and I anticipate um, reading about the different experiments that are going on, I hope soon. For bats, how do we keep them from approaching the turbines in the first place? Well, one way that's being, um, that's being investigated by people in uh, USGS is ultraviolet lighting. Humans can't see it, but bats definitely can. Um, and the idea is if we light the, the turbines with the UV, um, perhaps they will see them in such a way as, as we'll keep them away from them. Again, it would be great if this could work. It's still in the early phases, but um, they're doing some research on it right now. To keep bats, another way to keep bats from approaching turbines is to use acoustic deterrence. In effect, the idea is to jam their radar. We're trying to admit, emit noises that humans can't hear, um, but that are in the foraging frequencies of bats for, that are echolocating. We're hoping that these um, that the bats will find these noises really irritating and go forage somewhere else, somewhere away from the turbines. So this, this deterrent was um, had a pilot study done on it. And on the left, you can see here traces of bat paths for five minutes at a pond when deterrents were not on. Immediately, the next five minutes, they turned the deterrent on and these little red marks are the, the number of bats that pass through. So it wasn't completely um, effective to get to have no bats pass, but um, certainly a lot fewer bats passed when the deterrent was on than when, when the deterrent was off. So clearly signs that that deterrent was effective. One of the issues though, is this post here is only about 20, 25 meters from the, from the um, de deterrent. And if you put that on a 45 meter blade, that shows that we're only going to get our noise out to about halfway through the blade, maybe not all the way out. And so bats that are out in that space where the turbines are also spinning the or the blades are moving the fastest might still be at risk. So we put this out into an experiment. <clears throat> we place these deterrents on the nacelle up there at 80 meters and had them emit um, sometimes on, uh, you know, with an experimental design, sometimes on, sometimes off, and look to see what happened with mortality of the bats at below those turbines. This graph has on the x-axis just um, lists different species of, or species groups. We've combined all of the bats into one group and then individual bat species here in these other groups. The one one line says that the mortality when deterrents were on was exact was the same as when no de the deterrents were off when nothing was was being emitted. And so for we want these dots to be below that one one line in, um, implying that the deterrents reduced mortality. And we can see that for a few species, it's kind of down there, about half the mortality, but the uncertainty in our estimates was large enough that we couldn't say for certain um, that these deterrents were effective. Unfortunately, for one species, the eastern red bat, we did have a um, enough um, precision on our estimate, little enough uncertainty that we could say that the deterrent probably caused something between a uh, another 50% increase all the way to a fourfold increase in the mortality of eastern red bats when the deterrents were on. So the question is, what happened? Are they attracted? Um, does, did they hear those sounds as maybe being competitors and they were attracted to and wanted to drive them away? We really don't know. Um, but it does emphasize just the idea that a technique that we might find for one particular species may not necessarily translate well to all species. So finally, I'm going to look at altering turbine design. I said that the sound of deterrence couldn't reach the full length of the blade. Well, one day I was traveling down the Columbia Gorge and I saw something I'd never seen before, and that was turbines 
with these little serrations on their edges. I had looked into, um, sorry, I had looked into this before and, and asked all kinds of engineers whether I could think about doing something, you know, putting deterrence on their blades. And I always got the answer, don't mess with my blades. So I was really curious about what was going on here. I looked into it and I found out that this was the brainchild of an engineer, an acoustic engineer in Denmark, who designed these add-ons to reduce the sound of um, blades as they rotate, hopefully to make them more um, acceptable by people because a lot of people don't like that sound. Um, <clears throat> so I asked him, if, so I called him up and or arranged in a meeting and called him up and said, so I asked him if you can devise an add-on that will produce high frequency sounds, um, <clears throat> sorry, that will um, reduce the sound. Can you produce an add-on that can produce high frequency sounds that will deter a bat? And after talking about this for quite a while, the final answer was yes, I think he could try. My job was to go back and try and find somebody to um, also figure out what frequencies we needed to project so that he could work on it. This is definitely research that has not been funded. Um, it's very exciting to me that it could take place, but we, um, but it's definitely just in the conceptual stage. It has, it speaks of large possibilities. So what else could we do? Well, we could design turbines in completely different ways. This, this was actually at the uh, Paris Accord talks um, in, uh, 20, in uh, 17. And apparently it's a functional turbine and it powered the lights in their, in their facility. We can put uh, vertical turbines on, on um, warehouses. And these are designed to be on the edge so that they catch the wind, but also so that they um, don't impede solar access. We can change the shapes of the blades and the way they rotate, like these vertical axes. Sometimes some people are thinking about even bladeless turbines, which would bode well for, for uh, wildlife. Another example of bladeless turbines. And offshore, turbines that are where the mechanisms are actually on, on the ground or uh, close to the sea and easily accessible rather than 100 meters up in the air have lots of advantages and this this particular example doesn't have um moving blade parts so who knows it might be a a, a real um advantage to wildlife so in summary i just want to emphasize that the work that i've described tonight could not happen without strong collaboration among industry government non-government organizations academics everyone we all need to work together to reduce the impacts of renewable energy on wildlife as we expand this portfolio to meet our carbon needs or carbon reduction goals. So thank you for this opportunity and hopefully this gives you an idea of some of the science that's being done to inform policy relevant, relevant decisions. I'm going to leave you with just a slide that shows some links to some of the things I talked about. Thank you. Excellent, Manuela. Thank you so much. You've covered a lot of stats and facts, and a lot has changed in the last 10 years since you've given your talk. Um, I think it was great. Well, I've been uh, moderating the questions that have been coming through so far. A lot of these are anonymous, and um, again, I think that, uh, yeah, we learned a great deal today. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get well, I'm going to remind folks, first of all, that use the Q&A chat window, and um, I've been putting in links through Manuela's talk, um, just as references and resources, but also this is a great place to ask your question for her, okay? Um, I'm going to start off with the ones that came through first. Someone said, very interesting talk. Uh, do you find wind turbine operators are responsive to turning off turbines when bats or condors are in the area, do some refuse? Oh, that's a that's I think something I don't really know. Um, there's no. Um, it's it's sort of a 
uh, facility by facility specific question. Um, some of them have agreements with Fish and Wildlife Service um, in order to try and reduce their impacts to certain certain species. And so they do. They they turn them off when they're required. Others, um, I I don't really know whether they do um, or. Um, yeah, so I don't I, I guess that's a fish and wildlife question. Um, another question came through and asked if eagles or condors are sensed, how fast can the turbines be shut down? That's the first question. And the second one says fast enough to help the birds. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually it's it it is fast enough to help the birds. Um, they are spinning, like I said, at about 10 or sometimes 20 RPM. So, and they're huge and very heavy, but they do have mechanisms in them that allow them to stop rotating or come very close to stopping, stopping rotating um, within about 30 seconds. So it is, if you can detect the eagle coming 250 meters away, you have time to reduce the speed of the turbine to help it. Excellent. Another person asked, how quickly can a turbine be shut down? Can this really be effective? Again, that's the same, basically the same question. Yeah, they can be shut down in 30, 30 seconds um, and it can be. Great. Another anonymous asked, when were cameras first introduced and have you seen any improvement on wildlife mortality since installation? Um, they, oh gosh, I think in one study in Wyoming, they were introduced in 2017, I think. Um, so in that one, it's, there is some evidence of reduction, but it hasn't had enough time. They haven't had enough time, um, to be able to, to see whether that reduction is, um, is going to be consistent for very long. So. Only one study that I know is really at the point of um, producing mortality impact estimates. Okay. And it's not uh, it's not a slam dunk. <laughs> I wish it was, but it's not. <laughs> They're still working on it, though. All right. Awesome. Someone gave some feedback and they mentioned something about the bladeless turbines and they said, yes, blade, uh, bladeless turbines. I've seen examples and they seem like they have potential. Well, that would be that would be very, very interesting if they if they, you know, take over the rest of the tenfold increase that we have to do. Yeah. All right. Heidi wants to know, she says, I always learn so much from you, Manuela. Thank you. Do the software and approaches you've developed work with offshore modeling too? And um, she says, offshore seems harder as bird and bat carcasses will sink, making estimation of mortality even more challenging. Um, how can we cite offshore wind farms responsibly? Boy, that is the million dollar question. <laughs> we can't find the, the carcasses, right? We don't have the same, we can't use those same techniques on offshore by any means. However, there are people, one of them is here at Oregon State University where I am, um, who they're putting cameras not to look out away from the turbine, but to look along the turbine blade to see if they can detect when a, the blade has been hit by, um, by something. So those, if those become successful, then we would have really useful information about exactly when the, the, and so by by knowing that what the weather conditions were, what the wind conditions were, all those things, um, when and where on the blade the collision occurred. So to, to know whether it's far out or where, whether it's close in, where, where are the issues? So that would be great. However, we still would have a lot of, I'm, I'm not sure we would have the camera would be able to identify its species. And so it might, it, you know, it, it's not the same to kill a certain kind of gull as it is to kill a gull that is endangered or a turn that's endangered, and they both are kind of big white birds. So um, it's the 
determining the mortality impacts from collision on offshore is a, a really tough problem. And just kind of picking, uh, piggyback off of, of that explanation, someone just asked, what about helix turbine designs? Yeah, I think th those are like, I, I showed a picture of one that was like a semi helix anyway. Um, those are very interesting. Again, though, we would probably be in the same place as we were 10 years ago, where we still have to, to look and see what the impacts are. We would have to measure them um, because, because they do have blades and they do rotate, it's possible. However, because they have such a much smaller sphere of influence, it's also possible that they would have a, a much less uh, impact. Okay, awesome. Um, let's see here. Anonymous wants to know, what does one dark blade help prevent collisions with turbines? No, if anybody knows. I mean, the idea is perhaps that that because it's dark, it sh it causes a different visual um, and the eagles are more inclined to actually see it and not disregard it as they're just flying through. But I don't think anybody really knows what the mechanism is behind it. Let's see here. We also have someone asking, how has your mythology been applied to ocean wind power? Um, the methodology that I have for the statistics of estimating mortality hasn't, and that's because we can't find the carcasses on the ocean. <laughs> so as far as I know, it hasn't been applied. Um, yeah. Only land, land based. Only land based. Got it. However, the um, the evidence of absence, which is uh, a technique or a statistical tool to help um, infer what kinds of of take or what kind of mortality there might have been from a rare situation. As long as you can estimate the probability of detecting that mortality, then you can use the tools. So the evidence of absence has been used in um, in tuna bycatch turtles that are bycatch from the tuna industry. The tuna industry ha in in Hawaii has this great um, process where they randomly select boats that are going out fishing to have an observer on them. When the observer's on them, they watch every single haul and look for turtles. And so we they will detect the turtles. So the detection probability is basically the, the fraction of the um, ships that are going out there. And it's easy to estimate, it's about 25%. And so with that, we can use those tools then to say, okay, we saw this many turtles in this bycatch. We would expect to see 25% of what could be out there. How many could, could we have, you know, could we have missed? And so how many are have been put at risk? So it's not that the, these tools could be applied in other things. They can be applied in oil spills. It's all about being able to have the probability of detection estimable. And that's where we have trouble offshore. We can't estimate the probability of detecting the carcass or it's close to zero. <laughs> okay, and unfortunately I, I failed a little part that they had mentioned within their question they had said i thought ge turbines didn't respond well to idf i'm not sure what that stands for but and take up to 1.5 mins to shut down ah well that's possible that different turbines i'm sure have different different um operation so some may be slower at being able to shut down that okay Sorry about that. That was like kind of a two-parter, but <laughs> um, what do you think about the prospects of identiflight and its effectiveness in rough terrain? Oh boy, that's a very specific question that I guess I, um, if the asker wants to engage me in a conversation on that, then I would be happy. But I think that's really specific about, about the technique that might be a little bit too specific for this audience. Okay, fair enough. Um, we have someone else asking, we have a lot of good questions here. Um, 
has USGS studied the impacts of carbon-free renewable, renewable energy and its positive benefits to climate change, and therefore positive benefits to birds, bats, and other wildlife? And then the second part here says, do the positive ecosystems climate benefits balance or potentially offset the direct impacts? Boy, um, certainly people have looked at that from different perspectives. Whether um, someone's done a comprehensive study about that, I don't know, and I'm not even sure a comprehensive study could be done. It's like, um, so I do know that there are some USGS authors who have addressed that question, um, so that there are some people that are looking at it. Um, I can't speak to what they came down with as their um, their take home message on it. Okay. We have several more here, so bear with. <laughs> um, one wants to know, we know AWEA, again, I'm not sure what the acronym stands for, but American Wind says, Energy Association. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Um, has done much research on wind energy impacts to wildlife and methods to, redu to reduce those impacts. However, it appears citing relocation to avoid wildlife impacts and mitigation factors are voluntary actions that are often not adopted. Do you know the rate of citing and operation mitigation actions based on voluntary recommendations for avoidance? And they have a second part, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you uh, go answer that one first. The questioner brings up a good point that um, the industry is constrained by many, many different factors. The first of all, they have to have good wind, right? But then they have to be far enough from airports. They have to be far from um, human, human, um, infrastructure, human residences, and all that kind of stuff. They they have all kinds of constraints on them that narrows it down. Um, putting more constraints on them for wildlife is, um, is an important thing if that is known to save the wildlife. But as far as I know, that's again, something that's done on an individual basis in negotiation with the Fish and Wildlife Service, where in their impact assessment, um, reports, they look to see whether the sighting is in fact something that they think is is of concern. But okay. so far there is no there's no overarching, um, you know, nobody's produced a map that says that everybody in the wind energy industry has to um, restrict building in these areas, as far as I know. Um, the second part to that question from that first is what can we do to increase the voluntary avoidance citing and changes? Um, I think I think for to start to have good science that says these areas are high risk. Um, and then after that, I don't know what we can do except for, you know, talk to your congressperson, uh, talk and figure out whether or not it's worth putting a law in there. And um, but but I think I think the other thing we should do, I, sh I should take that back. Um, I think that conversation and engagement with the industry to keep it from having to be a regulatory thing and just have it be something that they're agreeing to do because it's um, it is known to you know if we can show that it's helpful then I think that um, having that conversation is probably the best place to start. Okay. We have time for a couple more questions and I think uh, we're going to be closing it out. Um, so thank you again to everyone who sent in questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single one but um, you guys have so many great questions. Um, somebody wants to know, can you say anything about new technical advances in detecting strikes more accurately? What about light attraction as a factor for night migrants? Um, 
I think I, I did speak a little bit to what's being done now of, of detecting strikes more accurately. There are people that are working on trying to put cameras on the blades to know when and where the strikes are occurring. We're using cameras, thermal cameras, to know what's happening with bats. Although it does appear that the thermal cameras um, aren't picking up, we aren't able to see all of the mortality, <laughs> you know, that occurs. We have cameras on on turbines, we might see a strike like I showed, um, but we see far fewer strikes than we find carcasses on the ground. So we're not seeing everything in our thermal cameras. Um, so that's, yeah, the, the ability to know when and where on the blade those things, uh, the, the collisions are occurring is a really important thing to for us to know to be able to understand better what kinds of behavior um, is happening when. Okay. And last question: um, Can eDNA be used to detect which species hits the blades, realizing that it's not as easy collection process? <laughs> Great idea. I haven't heard that one. That's very interesting. Um, I would imagine it could if you could figure out how, how to collect the collect those samples. Um, yeah, that's a that's a very interesting idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, I believe that's all we have time for tonight. And thank you again, Manuela, for your talk and for answering all these questions that have come in from our audience. Um, and again, thanks to all of you out there virtually who joined us this evening. Um, in case you would like to watch this lecture again by Manuela or share it with others, uh, Manuela's lecture will be available in about a week for on-demand viewing on our website at www.usgs.gov forward slash PLS. And we will go ahead and we'll add that um, in the chat. So just in case you ever want to go to our website, it's there. The other thing that we want to point out is um, her lecture will be posted under the latest lecture section on our page. Um, you can find videos of our past lectures on there under the latest lecture tab, as mentioned. And um, the other thing that I wanted to point out was the multimedia archive of our lectures. Um, as Manuela had mentioned, she did a lecture back in 2012, and I put that also in the chat. If you wanted to take a look at our past lectures that we have spanning two decades, um, and it's under our multimedia section. And uh, again, you can check out her lecture and from 2012, and you'll see how much has changed since then. Um, also on our website, you will also see the lecture schedule for the remainder of 2022, as well as um, all the talks that we have coming up in the new year in 2023. And if you would like to be added to our mailing list and receive these notices of our monthly lectures, send us an email at wmcesic at usgs.gov and we will happily add you to our mailing list. And finally, we do hope that you join us again next month on November 17th at 6 p.m. Pacific time to hear about endangered bumblebees, science and on threats and recovery with research ecologist John Mola. And until next time, same time and same place. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>